October 10th is World Mental, Mental Health, Health Day. And three days before October 10th in 2002, the front cover of Newsweek in the United States featured this teenage girl. And it told parents over in the United States that their teenagers were quite likely to get depressed. And if this wasn't treated, they would go on to a life of alcoholism and drug abuse and divorce and job failure and suicide. But there was good news. We now had new treatments for teenagers who were depressed. Prozac had just been approved for use in this age group. And as Newsweek knew, paroxetine called Paxil in the United States and Zoloft were just about to be approved by FDA. So <clears throat> a year before, a clinical trial of, of Paxil in children who were depressed, which had been carried out in the United States, had just been published in the journal with the highest impact factor in child mental health. And it had an authorship line to die for. These were very big names in uh, the field. So if these authors' names were on the article, and it was in this journal, this was something that most doctors were going to believe. This was study 329. Now, it's often called the Keller et al. article from its first author's name, Martin Keller. The trial, the protocol for the trial had been drawn up 10 years previously. The trial had begun in uh, eight years previously, and it had concluded three years before the published article came out. So it took three years from the point the trial ended to the point of, of publication of this article, which said, this drug works wonderfully well for teenagers who are depressed, and it's safe. There are no problems giving it. The sales representatives for uh, the company uh, were told by uh, uh, the marketing uh, department that this is the kind of thing you say to doctors, that this is a cutting edge landmark study which shows that SSRI and our SSRI in particular is very helpful for teenagers who are depressed, much better than the older antidepressants we have. So now, at that point in time, and this is at 2002, any of you who are involved in medicine and went along to mental health meetings or cardiology meetings or internal medicine meetings, in the United States at least, and in Europe also, this was the scene you saw. Yes, there were lectures happening in lecture theaters, but a huge area in, at the conference was occupied by the pharmaceutical companies selling their drugs. And this is Philadelphia in 2002, just before World Mental Health Day. And on the program for the meeting, there were reports from three clinical trials of uh, Paxil being given to teenagers who are depressed or teenagers who are anxious or teenagers who have various different problems. And all of these abstracts, and to most doctors uh, at the meeting, these would have appeared totally separate clinical trials. So you've got three different clinical trials here, all making uh, the same claim that our drug is great for teenagers and is very safe to give. And in our aim around that time, GlaxoSmithKline, who make paroxetine, were winning advertising awards for helping persuade people who were shy and introverted that, that they, they had, had an illness. They had an illness called social anxiety disorder. And you're being held back by this illness. If you just take our treatment, 
you're going to be able to succeed in life. You're going to be the person you really want to be. And these, as I say, these, these, uh, these adverts won a wards for being so good. And the upshot of all of this was at the company, at, at this point in time, Paxil was earning for the company two billion dollars per year, which back then was a very large amount of money. So, three days before World Mental Health Day, Newsweek were letting people know that we've got good treatments for children who are depressed, and Prozac had been approved, and three days after the Newsweek article, as Newsweek knew, this is FDA writing to GlaxoSmithKline saying, we are happy to approve paroxetine for teenagers who are depressed. Very few people would have seen this letter from FDA. It isn't the kind of document that's out there anywhere that you can find easily. But there was a problem looming that GSK didn't know about, and FDA didn't know about. It was what we could call the little girl who says the emperor has no clothes problem. This is Shelley Joffrey, and she's not trained in medicine, and she's not trained uh, in science. She's a journalist. And she's part of a BBC team who worked for a program called Panorama, which is one of BBC's investigative affairs programs. And up till this issue, Panorama, in 50 years, had covered lots of topics but had never repeated themselves. On this topic, Panorama made four programs. So the first program, their interest began because, first of all, GlaxoSmithKline, GSK for short, were a UK company and had become the largest pharmaceutical company in the world and were headquartered just down the road from the BBC. So it seemed an obvious idea to make a program. The other thing was their drug had just become one of the best-selling drugs in the world, and it had also, in 2001, ended up on the wrong side of a verdict for, for uh, the first time. The, this was the Tobin trial, where Don Shell, whom you see on the left there, had been given Paxil by his family doctor for sleep problems. And 48 hours later, Don Shell put three bullets through the head of his wife, Rita, whom you see, he's holding her waist here, and three bullets through the head of his daughter, and three bullets through, through the head of his granddaughter, whom you see in his daughter's arm, before killing himself. And the jury in Cheyenne, Wyoming, returned a verdict against GSK. And this is the first verdict that ever been returned against a pharmaceutical company for a behavioral problem their drug had caused. So this was of interest to the BBC. The case is called uh, the Tobin case because the only person who didn't get killed here in the picture was the man on the far right who was the daughter's husband. So, <coughs> the BBC plans to go over to Philadelphia to uh, at the American Psychiatric Association meeting to interview the authors on study three to nine who are here, most of whom are going to be at that meeting. And the main uh, uh, producer behind the program gave Shelley Joffrey study two to nine to read on the plane on the way over. And this was the first time she'd seen it. As I said, she had no background. She didn't have the background training in these issues that probably all of you here in this room have. And that meant, maybe, that it was easier for her to spot the problems that most of you and most of us miss. 
The idea behind the program, first of all, was that this trial had been done in children who were poor from deprived parts of the United States, and we really needed to, to find out what the background story was. But when she read the article, she was interested in the idea that a lot of children had become emotionally labile on this drug. What does emotionally labile mean, she asked. And she was told, pay no heed to that. We're interested in just where the clinical centers for these trials were and where they were recruiting poor black children from deprived neighborhoods. So when she got to interview the authors, none of them agreed that any of the children were from poor, deprived areas. But when she asked any of the authors just to explain to her what emotionally labile meant, they all began to look very nervous. And she became more and more convinced that there was something important uh, about this term. This uh, just gives you an email exchange between herself and one of the key authors, the person who'd drawn up the protocol for the trial, a guy called Neil Ryan. And Neil Ryan was the person who got most nervous about it. Now, what she didn't know when she sent this email to him, Neil Ryan's response was to consult with GSK and say, what do I tell this journalist? And they uh, decided to tell the journalist nothing. So, three days after World Mental Health Day, three days after Paxil had been approved for teenagers who were depressed, and uh, the BBC didn't know this, they produced this program here where Shelley Joffrey interviews, this is her, interviewing this man here, Alistair Benbow. And the criticism that people have of uh, at the program was that these were journalists employing journalistic tricks to make the company person look bad. The lighting was bad on them, people said. Nobody was interested in what he was saying. They were just saying the lighting made him look shifty. But Alistair Benbow was actually trying to explain things that were a little awkward to explain, which was he was saying that the most common cause of death among teenagers is that they go on to commit suicide. So, you know, we really do need our treatment to help these children. Now, in the trial, in the paper that had actually been published, more children became emotionally labile on Paxil than on placebo. So, trying to respond this way, Alistair Benbow was in a very tricky kind of politician, in a very tricky kind of position. This was a politician trying to respond to a journalist that's asking them awkward questions. As I said, the BBC didn't know that Paxil had been approved by FDA at the point they made the program. They also didn't know that a group of lawyers had gone into FDA a few weeks before the approval and said, you guys need to be aware that GSK are using this term emotionally labile to hide a bunch of very serious behavioral problems, not just in the trials of children, but in uh, the trials of all age groups. So when FDA sent uh, the letter out, now you don't need uh, to be able to read this, but what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to leave uh, the slides behind. So anyone who wants to read the full approvable letter from FDA to GSK will be able to do so. You don't need to be able to read this. You only need to know that at the end of the approvable letter, FDA are saying to GSK, look, we're happy to approve your drug, but we'd like you to explain what emotionally labile means and give us a bit more of a feel for what's hiding beneath these words. So after the October 13th program, the BBC had 65,000 emails into the program. Now, remember, this is 2002. Bruno probably has 65,000 emails per day now, but emails were rare back then. So when a program gets 65,000 emails, this was 
extraordinary. And a lot of them were from people saying that they had exactly the kinds of program, um, exactly the kinds of problems that the program outlined, which is children becoming suicidal, children becoming aggressive, children becoming hooked to the drug and unable to get off, and having serious problems when they tried to get off. So this led BBC to make a second program, which was based on the emails that had come into them. And it was called Emails from the Edge. <clears throat> what you see here is the MHRA. This is the headquarters of Britain's drug regulator. And the reason you've got this image here is that at this point, patient groups were headquartered outside the regulator saying, look, we're awfully concerned about this group of drugs generally. And the regulator is under huge pressure. So the BBC make a second program, and in this, they change the way Alistair Benbow looks. The lighting is much, much softer. They make him look much more sympathetic. This is the spokesperson for GSK. But the content of what he has to say is almost even worse. It's, if we were to give these drugs to all the children in a school, only one classroom of children will become suicidal. It's just not a very clever way. I mean, he thinks he's saying that it's a rare problem, but the words that come out make the problem look awfully serious. So, at this point as well, what you don't know is this. Here's an advert, and it's a very creative advert. It's got a young teenage boy looking cool. He's, it's even down to the earring in his ear is well placed. And you don't need to be able to read uh, um, the small text. Just read the little bit at, at the right hand side. That will give you uh, at the, um, at the message that, the ho that goes the whole way through this advert. <clears throat> Things like, if you're depressed, who should you consult? A TV presenter or a doctor? We have total faith in our drug, and you should too. Uh, depression is extraordinarily common, and this is the commonest reason people go on to things like suicide. Judge Siroxa, that's the English trade name for the drug, on clinical trials, not trial by media. Now, the reason I'm showing you all of this is for an extraordinary fact, which is there are 100,000 people who work for GSK. And this is an advert the company has produced for its own employees. It's not an advert for the rest of you. This is internal to the company, who are very nervous about what the people working for the company will be thinking about what they're seeing on TV. OK, so <clears throat> here's GSK. And this is May 22nd, 2003. This is a week after the second BBC program, where again GSK said there is no problem on our drug. At this point, they're responding to the FDA's letter from half a year before saying, we approve your drug, but we want you to explain a few things like, uh, you know, what does emotionally labile mean? And this is uh, the GSK response, which makes it clear that there's a doubling of the suicidal act rate in their clinical trials of children who are depressed. And that emotionally labile mostly refers to children becoming suicidal. At the time when GSK made this report to FDA, they say there's an increased rate of children becoming suicidal, but it's not statistically significant 
so you don't need to worry about it. Russell Katz, who is the head of that branch of FDA that approves drugs to be used for nervous problems, writes to somebody else in uh, FDA called Andy Mossholder, saying, look, Andy, you're the person who reviewed this drug when we approved it. There seem to be concerns about it. The English, as we now know, are prone to nervous breakdowns over Brexit and things like that. Well, back in 2002, FDA are saying the English are wobbling. They think there could be a problem with this drug, and uh, we haven't seen any problem. But we want you to look back through the material that we've had from the company to see what you spot. And Andy Mossholder takes three months to do this. Um, this is the English having their nervous breakdown. Three weeks after that, the English ban all SSRIs for children who are teenagers, who are depressed, are anxious, other than Prozac, which have been approved a year before. What they say to the media is, well, if you want to give one of these drugs, give Prozac. Okay, so... A few months later, and this is October 2003, it's a year after the Newsweek article, FDA have been through all of uh, uh, the material, and this is Tom Lochran, who works for FDA, and he's briefing the media, and he's saying, look, there's been all this fuss about these drugs causing children to have problems, but we in FDA don't think it's a real problem. We did say to you back in June, just be cautious about these drugs, but we've looked at the material in more detail, and we don't now think it's a real problem. But we're going to have a, a, a committee meeting in February 2004, where we will, tell the, we will show the entire world all of the material we have, and we'll call in experts and let them uh, uh, decide what the data looks like and what we should do. Okay? So, the meeting's scheduled for February the 2nd, 2004. This is where the issues are going to be finally settled. And six days before that meeting, the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology has got a working party together of experts. And you see the 10 experts that have been convened here and three of the experts, the ones whose names are highlighted in black, are on the working party panel. These have also been authors on study three to nine. And the conclusion from this working panel, which is generally within uh, the United States back then, regarded as being uh, the super scientists. These are the people who really know what clinical trials look like, what the data really looks like. So if these people say there's no problem, then there is no problem. And these people conclude that the SSRIs for children, they've got access to more than just study three to nine. They say that these drugs work well for children and there are no problems. None of these people wrote the document that said this. It was written by a public relations agency called Get Your Message Across. So, this is at the agency GYMR, and this is their mission statement. We know how to take the language of science and medicine and translate it into the more understandable language of health. Okay? So, they, their offer to uh, the pharmaceutical industry and regulators is, if you want to ensure that the entire United States gets the message, we will ensure that this is reported in every major newspaper and every media channel right across the country. And that's what happened before February the 2nd. Something else happened, which was that Andy Mossholder, who is the person within FDA had been asked to review the GSK clinical trials, a story appeared the day before the meeting in uh, the San Francisco Chronicle, which said that he'd been 
gagged. He was not going to be let present his version of the results at the FDA meeting. Now, I've got this here <clears throat> because the most famous whistleblower within FDA is a guy called David Graham, whom you see here. And Andy Mossholder and David Graham share a common thing, which was they're both Christians. Now, when I say they're Christians, I mean born again Christians, who so distrust the state that they have their children educated at home. This is an interesting angle on the whole story that I'm going to leave just there for you guys to think about. OK, so on the day of the meeting, on February uh, the 2nd, FDA had a whole bunch of people there, a whole bunch of experts. They had the world's media there. There, had, there was 72 people who were allowed to make presentations to FDA that could last three minutes only. And in the middle of the meeting, this document here uh, appears, which is a, an internal GSK document from 1998. And the bit, I mean, what you see here is only a bit of a six-page document that makes it clear that in 1998, just after Study 3 to 9 has completed, that GSK recognized that their drug did not work in this clinical trial. And that it was going to be a problem showing it to FDA. And that what they were going to do was pick out positive bits from the clinical trial, which you see at the end here, and that was going to be published. And that's the Keller paper. It's the positive bits picked out and published with the negative bits hidden. And the GSK document makes it clear that it would be bad for our adult market if anyone thought these drugs didn't work for children. And this is the reason they were going to take the approach that they were going to take. A few years later, they decided, we can show these data to FDA, and FDA won't spot a problem. And this is, this is the end of the FDA letter to GSK approving the drug. And I've taken a bit of it out, blown it up so you can read it. And it says, FDA are saying, we agree with you, GSK, that you've got three negative trials. They only did three trials in children who were depressed. And all three are negative. But we agree with you that they are negative. But we're still going to approve the drug. And we don't require you to mention in the label of the drug that these were negative trials. So, because of the previous document you've just seen, where GSK say we've got negative trials and this isn't a good image for our drug, we're going to pick out the good bits of this trial and publish those. This lays the basis for a fraud charge that New York State take against GSK. Further to be fraud, Bruno may fiddle you know, the data from some clinical trial that he does, or I may think he's fiddled at the data, but if I don't have evidence that shows he, he knew what he was doing and made it clear why he was doing it, then I can't say that there's been a fraud. There has to be proof of intention for a fraud charge. So the GSK document gave New York State proof of intention, and they lodged a fraud charge against GSK. And the other thing that happened was Congress decided to, uh, to subpoena Andy Mossholder and ask him what had gone on. Now, I've left one bit out. When FDA had the February 2nd meeting at which the document came to light, the intention was to say that these drugs are fine. They work well and there are no problems and we're going to sort of put the problems uh, to one side. It had become clear at the meeting 
that most of the trials that FDA had of any of these drugs done in children who were depressed were negative trials. At the end of the day, the meeting in the room, or the mood music in the room was, we can't approve these drugs for children who are depressed, other than Prozac, which had been approved. So FDA didn't want to say we need to put warnings on these drugs. They said, we're going to wait for half a year. We're going to ask an independent group. We're going to ask Columbia University to look at what the data looks like. Um, the Andy Mossholder report had said, that's the internal FDA report had said there was an increased risk. But FDA weren't going to let the public see that. They were going to give their own view that there is no increase in risk. So they had um, I decided the way to solve this problem was to get an independent group from Columbia University to look at the issues. And they said, we're going to give them half a year to look at the issues, so we'll meet again on September 14th. A week before that meeting, as I say, Congress has begun to uh, investigate the issues and has subpoenaed Andy Mossholder and is about to ask the bosses of FDA, what's really going on here? The other thing that's happened is that GSK have resolved a fraud action uh, with New York State and have said, well, we will make the data from our clinical trials publicly available. Now, that hasn't happened by the time uh, the second FDA hearing happens. But at uh, the second FDA hearing, this is just, just a brief vignette that I probably shouldn't uh, include here because it's going to take up time. But I'm going to leave all of uh, the slides behind, and I'm going to tell you what this, which they will give you the exact words used by uh, the woman on the left, who's, who's um, uh, uh, the mother of the girl she's holding in her arm, who's called Candace. And the Miller family, whom you see here, live straight across the road from Tom Loughran, and she gets up in the middle of the meeting where we've got the FDA panel uh, at the top of the room, which includes Tom Loughran, who's the key person in all of this, trying to herd the goats or the sheep or whatever, you know, the right way to see that there is no problem. She gets up and says, look, Dr. Loughran, it's a tricky position I'm in. Your daughters and my daughters were in the same school. One of your daughters was in the same class as my daughter. My daughter was given Zoloft at the age of 12 because she was anxious about going to school. You know, she had school refusal. It's, I don't know about any of you guys, but I had school refusal briefly at the age of 12 and I didn't fortunately get an SSRI. I went back to school and everything was fine. Well, some people would say everything was fine since, but uh, Candace was put on Zoloft, and a week later, committed suicide. And Tom Loughran knew that these drugs, she had become aware at this meeting, that Tom Loughran knew that these drugs could do this. So there was a very dramatic moment in there, the meeting where she confronts them. <clears throat> So this comes back to this document here, and the next bit of the talk, which is coming back to this paper here, which you've seen, and the 20 authors on it, none of whom write the paper, none of whom have access to the data behind the paper. The person that wrote the paper here is here, Sally Layden. And she writes a paper which conceals the hazards of the drug, but without telling lies. The children who had been suicidal have become emotionally labile. And most people, like Bruno back then or me, reading the paper for the first time, wouldn't think that becoming emotionally labile was a big deal. The person from GSK who she's emailing with is very Nerve. He knows what uh, the problems in uh, uh, the study have been, and he's clearly nervous about the fact that she's done such a good job in hiding them. I mean, he isn't saying to her she's broken the law, but she's done a very good job in hiding what the issues are. 
she hasn't broken the law because, um, well, she hasn't seen the data either. GSK have presented her with numbers and she's making the best job she can of the numbers she's given. Now what becomes clear at this point is that there have been 15 trials done in children who are depressed. As I say, almost all of them except the Prozac trials are negative and all of them are either ghost or company written. I just want to contrast this with this is the range of journals where I've tried to write about this issue, about children becoming suicidal, teenagers becoming suicidal on antidepressants. And these are all the journals who have refused to review an article, even with all the accompanying documents sh to show them there is no legal risk you're, you're publishing my article. Clearly, the journal that appeals to me the most is I tried to get this story you're hearing now published in a journal called Index on Censorship, and they censored what you are hearing now. So, this goes back to the fraud action New York State took against GSK. GSK said, okay, we'll resolve this by giving you, by giving the wider public the data from our clinical trials. Now, when the company runs a trial, they prepare a clinical study report afterwards, a CSR, okay? So GSK said they will put the CSRs up on the company website so that everybody could read the trials they'd done of this drug and children who are anxious, children who are depressed, children who are this, children who are that, and their diabetes drugs and other drugs as well. Uh, one of the things that was linked into all this um, and uh, into, into, into uh, actually Paxil given to children in particular was this whole issue about just how fraudulent had the company been. And although the New York State action was resolved, the Department of Justice in the United States took an action against GSK and this action was resolved in 2012 when GSK were subject to what was then the biggest fine in corporate history. They, were, they resolved the case for $3 billion. And this is a report in uh, the BMJ at the end of 2012, which notes a very small notice, really, within a medical journal, and there's very few other notices in any medical journal about this uh, event, and most doctors haven't ever heard of it, even though it's of huge importance, you'd have thought. It's a small notice, and it features the CEO, the boss of GSK then, a man called Andrew Whitty. And here's the BMJ three months later, featuring Andrew Whitty, the CEO of GSK, in an Obama-type picture. This is the candidate of hope. This is the kind of image that was being used by uh, Obama when he ran for uh, at the presidency. Andrew Whitty is being portrayed in the same kind of way. This is the acceptable face of the pharmaceutical industry. And a very clever trick has happened in the intervening period, which is that Andrew Whitty has signed on to and possibly been the creator of something that most of you think is a very good thing. It's uh, uh, an initiative called All Trials, which looks like people who are independent of industry calling on industry to provide all the data from their clinical trials. It's not. It's an initiative where industry let people know about the clinical trials that they've done and provide a certain amount of data that industry are prepared to let the world see. So this is what all trials, well here's um, all trials and my concern with this, and this is uh, 2013 when all trials is launched and GSK immediately support all trials. 
is that really what we want, what the world thinks it's being offered is all data. And what we want is all data rather than all trials. So around this time, there's an initiative, and there's an article in there, the BMJ, about this by a man called Peter Doshi, who's one of the most creative and incisive people around the place. And he's come up with this, this really good idea about restoring abandoned trials. It's an initiative he calls uh, uh, the Riot uh, 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 Initiative. And the idea is where we have the data from clinical trials that if we think they've been misrepresented, we'll, that an independent group will access the data and try and produce the right version of what the clinical trials should have looked like. And GSK, of course, have told people that well, we've put the company study reports up on uh, the web. So study 3 to 9 is exactly the perfect study to say, well, you know, we will rewrite what this trial should have looked like. Now, one of the interesting things that happened is this. First of all, the original study 3 to 9 is an 11-page article. So you see the number of pages there. The company study report is something like, on this slide, I think you've got around 800 pages or something like that. Uh, that's what a company st study report, their internal version of what uh, the study looks like. The company study report, however, comes with a, a appendix A, a appendix A, appendix B, appendix C, appendix D, E, F, G, and H. When you had a pen, well, one of the things that we learn is that when GSK had put the company study report up on the web, when you read it closely, it mentioned the appendices, but they weren't there. We asked GSK to put the appendices up on the web, and they said, well, okay, we'll put appendices A to G up there, but we won't give you appendix H. When you add the appendices A to G in there, it brings the number of pages up to five and a half thousand pages. So we've got five and a half thousand pages to work with to rewrite what this study really looked like. But of course, I'm sure you, like me, would have figured, well, what's an appendix H? Wouldn't it be interesting to have appendix H? And a Appendix H contains what are called the clinical report forms, the CRFs. This is closer to the raw data. It's, it's what the investigator seeing you in a clinical trial fills up, the rating scales and the report of the adverse events and things like that. There's 77,000 pages in Appendix H. And the problem is GSK are not prepared to hand it over. They will, they end up, they agree, and it's hard to know why they agree. I think it's just a mistake in the company. They agree to let us look at it through a triple lock portal. We can go into GSK through a triple lock system here, which means they can see every move we make and everything we look at, and the system chucks us off regularly but we spend a year working on it and end up with a view of what study 329 looks like. When we begin this, we've been in touch with uh, the BMJ, who say they would be very interested to publish a new version of study 329 once we have it done. And if you've ever tried to publish with uh, the BMJ, you'll have gone on the website and you'll see that they tell you that actually it takes roughly eight weeks from the time your article goes into them to the time you have an answer back from them as to whether they're going to publish or not. And it's usually two people review your article, it might be three. We have seven people review our article. It's reviewed seven times. It's accepted several times and then unaccepted several times. It goes to GSK for review. A year later, it's not published. We spend a year working on it, 
We spent a year working on BMJ afterwards to try and get it published, and we're not getting anywhere. In the end, it is published. It's published close to four years ago now. And this is what uh, the BMJ front cover looks like. It looks cute. And it looks like BMJ are very proud of the study. But uh, if you want to know the full story of what went on, you can go on to study329.org here, where we've got all of the internal documents and the history of the whole saga. Just to give you a brief view of what the results look like, GSK had claimed the drug works well in children who are depressed. We analyzed the efficacy data in all sorts of ways, in three different ways. We're told by the reviewers when we say, look, the results are negative. Well, try this way. Uh, and we do. And uh, there's no way you can torture the data to get a positive result out of it. One of the other things I should mention to you is this is an eight-week trial, as you'll see here. The protocol was for a 32-week trial. That's a six-month follow-up after the acute phase of the trial. GSK never published the six-month follow-up. That remained unpublished. Oh. The really interesting thing about this trial, though, is it's not about does this drug work or not. It's, an, it's a trial about how to hide the problems. And out of it has come my view that RCTs are the gold standard way to hide adverse events. And this is a few of the things that you can do. When events happen in trials, you have to have a coding system. And GSK used an obscure coding system which allowed them to code suicidal events as emotional liability. This is not illegal. But, you know, all trials will use a coding system of some sort. There was a failure to transcribe adverse events from the clinical report forms into uh, the company study reports. There's grouping of adverse events. And I'm going to show you a few of these. Let's leave this table here because it's a bit too busy. This is uh, the coding system. Uh, this is one of the most commonly used coding systems. And the cartoon here gives you uh, what I think is a good representation of what happens, which is you've got human diversity goes in one side of the coding, coding system, and everybody comes out looking much the same color on the opposite side of the coding system. But aside from that, there's tricks like this. There are problems like headache that could be neurological, or could be psychiatric, or could be cardiovascular, or could be coded under general. And there's a lot of headaches happen in clinical trials, just as there's a lot of dizziness. And if you move these around different bigger coding groups, and particularly if you include the psychiatric effects in the neurological group, then, and headaches also, you can make any problems, any behavioral problems disappear. So if you look at, at the bottom there, that's the original Keller paper in which you'll see five children became emotionally labile. Well, actually, they report six, but there's, of the six, five had become suicidal. And in the trial, paroxetine is compared to imipramine, and you see the number of people who have be, um, become suicidal on it. And there's one person who's become suicidal on, on placebo. When GSK report to FDA, when FDA say what's emotional liability all about, GSK write in half a year later to FDA and say, well, actually, there was more children who became emotionally labile. And this term means they became suicidal. And you see what they reported to FDA here. I've got it under SKB because it was Smith, Klein, Beecham who were doing the reporting rather than GSK. But you see there's a lot more suicidal events in this trial. Our FDA have been told for the first time that there's a lot more events than they had thought. When we get access to the raw data, which is up on uh, the top, you see there are a lot more events again. We have three times more events than were reported in the original article. And we don't have all the events. It would be a much longer lecture to um, tell you about all the events that have come to light since. 
This is the continuation phase. What you saw there was, what you saw on the previous slide was the efficacy in the first eight weeks. What you see here is what happens to children when they take the drug for the next six months. And again, you can't see any benefit for the drug over, over placebo. This is uh, the suicidal events that happen during uh, the next six months. And again, you see there's much more on active treatment than there is on placebo. And the worst phase of all is the withdrawal phase. And GSK didn't report on this at all. The highest rate of suicidal events happens when you stop the drug. Whether you stop in the acute phase, whether you drop out at that point, or whether you've been on the drug for half a year and then stop. And this is at a point where GSK were denying that there was any dependence and withdrawal from this drug at all. I'm going to skip that because it's a different story, uh, or a lengthier story. I'm just going to take you back to this slide. We took a year to get this article published in BMJ. And one of the problems was we noted headaches, and this was, this was moving all over the place to suit GSK, it seemed. And uh, one of the editor in BMJ who handled our article just happened to be a person who was a neurologist who had written a book on headaches. And she was very concerned at what she was seeing. She was not very concerned at what GSK had done. She was very concerned at us raising questions about what's the best way to code headaches. And she was the key person who held our article up for a year. Now, this got interesting. And when I found this book and Googled her, the story became even more interesting. When GSK were sued by the Department of Justice in the, UK, in the US and ended up paying $3 billion, one of the law firms representing them was Ropes and Gray. When GSK recently ran into trouble in China, the only law firm uh, defending them was Ropes and Gray. And uh, Elizabeth Loder's husband is a senior partner in Ropes and Gray. So is this one just one very obscure story? And this is my final point. I promise you I'm going on much too long. But we run controlled trials because open trials, we figure, are unsafe. You have a new drug, and you give it to doctors who are enthusiastic about new drugs, who give it to patients, and universally report tremendous benefits. So when the SSRIs come out, doctors in the United States, with a little help from the pharmaceutical companies, write up articles about, you know, they've given SSRIs to teenagers, and uh, in every case, these drugs have done wonderfully well. So you know, and I know, this is why we do controlled trials, that open studies like this are biased. So we've got to control the bias with a controlled trial. So as of 2004, I don't know, this is again all going to be small. You're going to have to trust me probably on this. As of 2004, when all this fuss blows up, these are the control trials that have been done. The ones that have been published have all been reported as positive. The ones that have been published have all been ghostwritten or written by the company. FDA and MHRA and EMA say they now agree that most of these trials were negative, except for the Prozac trials, which were positive. Well, if you look at this chart, I have N against the Prozac trials as well. The trials that FDA, when they approved Prozac, the trials of Prozac were negative trials. They were not positive trials. There is not a single positive trial as of that point in time in teenagers who are depressed. There's, and this is a little out of date, there's not a single positive trial since in children who are depressed. And trials have continued since 2004. There are more negative trials on Prozac in children. I mean, all, there's 
all of the trials in Prozac in children who are depressed are negative, and there's more of them for Prozac than for any other drug. There's now over 10,000 children who've been, who've been recruited to randomized trials of these drugs, and there's no positive evidence. Just to go back here, you see uh, the left column is ends the whole way down. The next column is excess. There's an excess of suicidal acts on active treatment. And the most interesting trial here in this column is one run by the NIH, supposedly, which is independent of industry, where um, under Prozac, if you look at, at the Prozac trials, you see excess and brackets 34V3. In this trial, there are 34 suicidal acts on Prozac versus three on placebo. There's seven major publications about this trial, and it's very difficult. You will not spot the 34 suicidal versus three suicidal acts on fluoxetine in any of these publications. So you'd have thought if we have <coughs> 30 negative trials, that we'd have stopped using this drug. This is the whole point behind control trials. When the control trials come in negative, it means we stop using the treatment. This is the greatest concentration of negative trials for any indication in any age group ever done. But antidepressants are now the most commonly used drugs by teenage girls barring oral contraceptives. Thanks. Y a-t-il... <coughs> Merci, David. Thank you, David, for this brilliant talk. Y a-t-il des réactions, des questions Thank you very much, very nice talk. Um, I have just one question and one comment about the difficulty we have to assess the adverse events. For instance, when you cite the example of the family who has uh, lost uh, their child, their daughter, we are not sure that this is the drug that is the cause of the suicide on one case. You know? This is the difficulty. and. If you say that we need control trials, we cannot also say at the same time that when we see an adverse event, it is because of the drug. So I want you to comment on this. Okay, well, just so you're clear, the rate at which children in control trials of these drugs go on to become suicidal, uh, because there's a doubling of the rate of children going on to become suicidal on these drugs in control trials, they now carry a black box warning. At least that's the story that many of you here in the room will believe. In fact, the rate at which adults go on to become suicidal on these drugs is exactly the same as children. The reason we've got a black box warning in the case of children is it's been difficult to show a benefit against which the risk can be put. In adults, we don't warn about the risks in the same way because of a supposed benefit. We don't want to tell people you may become suicidal on this drug in case they get scared off seeking treatment. But I want to come back to adults. This story did not begin in 2002 on World Mental Health Day. Twelve years beforehand, there had been an article about adults becoming suicidal on Prozac. And the interesting thing about the article was that you know, the doctors were very experienced people, very senior people, linked into Harvard, some of the most respectable and senior people in the field, who said, you know, this is interesting. We've got patients who have come to us who said, Doctor, I've been depressed and suicidal for years, but this was very different. What the drug is causing is very, very different to what the illness causes. I think that's great evidence that the drug causes a problem, particularly when you stop the drug and the problem clears up. If the person hasn't actually killed themselves, and you stop the drug and the problem clears up, and as they did, as this group did, others linked to them did, they gave the drug, 
in one extraordinarily famous case where this particular woman was given the drug and she became, she, well, one of the things a drug does is it can cause a condition. We use a strange word for it called akathisia. This means agitated. You end up in a state of turmoil. She ends up in a state of turmoil and she jumps off the roof of the building in which she's being treated and fractures her hips and legs and ends up in a wheelchair. But she's feeling emotionally a lot better. The, the, because she's been in hospital treated for her hips and legs, the, she's off uh, the Prozac, the agitation goes away, and at her instigation, they give her Prozac again, and she becomes agitated again. She has the same feelings that, I mean, they feel safe and she feels safe to take the drug again, because she's now in a wheelchair and they're keeping an eye on her. She's not going to jump off the building. There are a lot of reports of people becoming suicidal in this way on this group of drugs. The problem clears up and uh, reoccurs when you expose the person again to either the same drug or a different drug from the same group. So you can fool the person saying they're taking a completely different group, but give them an SSRI again and they become su su suicidal again. This is better causal proof and control trials. Um, I have a, uh, a shake of the head here saying no, but we can disagree on this point. But this, I think, is much better proof. But we can open it up to you all, uh, at, at the rest of you, and see what you think. What do you think of the fact that it's not doctors who opened this issue up? That it's a person who had nothing to do with healthcare, it's a journalist who opened the picture up. What do you think of the fact that it's not a man who opened the picture up, it's a woman? And that most of the adverse events of drugs that have been brought out in recent years have been put on the table by women, not men. Anyone, any thoughts? So maybe it's, uh, peut-être qu'il est l'heure de, de faire une petite pause, <coughs> parce qu'il y aura donc la deuxième présentation à deux heures et demie, peut-être, uh, maybe we could, we could have a break before the next talk in about 20 minutes, uh, à tout de suite.